Hello. I was uh, 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 awake at six o'clock this morning, uh, dreaming that um, I was too late for the conference. Uh, there were no slides, and when I finally found the slides, they st they started with um, big pictures of of Neo in uh, the Matrix Part Two, and then I I started talking about like yeah you know the Matrix cool cool movie, and I was starting to plug in this stuff uh, to make it work, and. Um, yeah, I was just really uh, making my way out of that, uh, that speech. It was horrible, but uh, I should have started saying that um, The Matrix 1 is an awesome movie, and Matrix 2 and 3 were quite less awesome. Uh, they should never have been created, I think, so it should have been just one, and then the rest should have been imagination. Um, but that's an opinion, and it could actually be uh, restated as advice. Like, if you never watched Matrix movies, just watch Matrix 1. Uh, well. Advice. This talk is also about advice. Um, and uh, by the way, the slides are on Twitter. Uh, and questions, I, I really prefer them to be online, even though uh, there was some trouble with that. I'm not sure if it's still possible to, uh, to use the app. I couldn't really follow the, uh, uh, the advice about that just now. But uh, I found it really practical to do it um, like uh, on stage instead of uh, with a microphone in the room. Uh, and also, there's a chance for everyone in the room to uh, to ask some questions. That is to say, if we have time. So uh, yeah, we'll see about that. Oh yeah, uh, sorry to say, uh, this, this talk is about web application architecture, but it's also about uh, uh, receiving advice, giving advice, and, and dealing with that, because it's an important uh, topic, I think. Uh, in particular, because um, we, at least I think, we are all on the internet, and we uh, look at each other for advice and for suggestions like programming tricks, uh, design advice, uh, design principles. But then there is always somebody wrong on the internet, right? Uh, and and this, is, uh, this is horrible. Uh, it's not just uh, the trolls that are, that are spreading fake news, of course, but, um, and, and are making people angry. But it's also the programming advice, the tips and tricks that we, we take each day, maybe through blog posts, maybe through other uh, people's tweets, and yeah, there's just so much wrong about that. Every time I look on, on, on Twitter, it's like, ah, oh, no, 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 please, people don't do that. You know, you will end up uh, in a very bad situation. Um, but actually, every time I tweet something, I'm very worried that, that I myself am, am someone who's giving bad advice. You know, I'm, I'm very probably one of them. And most probably, somebody else is thinking about me, like, please shut up, don't say this kind of thing, because people will do this in their projects, and they will end up failing badly. Uh, so this, this, this is a bit of a dilemma for me. Like, should I watch other people's advice? Should I uh, produce advice on the internet? Yeah, this is, this is really, really very hard. Um, but it's not to say that we shouldn't listen to any advice at all, nor that we should never produce any advice, because it's a very useful activity to talk to each other and say, yeah, this, this worked really well for me. Um, but yeah, just, just make sure, and this is, this is sort of uh, giving away the clue, just make sure to never blindly follow anyone, uh, anyone at all. Um, <clears throat> so what is good advice? I think it's interesting to, uh, to consider where it comes from uh, and, and what kind of advice should you trust or can you trust? Um, first of all, advice should come from experience. Any kind of thing that people say on the internet, uh, it should not be like copied from a book or copied from someone else. Like it should not be just retweeted. There should always be some explanation about, yeah, why, uh, why do I think that this works? So it should be rooted in experience. And there is another interesting thing going on there because once you have some experience in a project, uh, you, you sort of come to the conclusion that a project went rather well, and you're very happy about that. You look back at the history of the project, the kind of choices that you and your team made, and you consider your choices to be excellent choices because the, pro the project was successful. And you sort of make a causa uh, causation there where you say, my choice is the cause of the success of the project, right? And then you start telling people to use the same kinds of choices because you think, that the, um, the next time uh, somebody else will, will do the same or will, will have the same problem and they make the same choice as you did, they will be as successful as you are. And really, this is a, a thinking mistake. So that's, that's very, very good to be aware of. Um, and you start telling them to, uh, to do this, uh, this kind of thing that you did. Uh, and 
definitely if you're on Twitter and you have some sort of a reasonable amount of followers, I'm very sure that people will definitely try to copy your choices. And it's a very dangerous thing because these people, they work with uh, other people, different people than the ones you have been working with. They work in a different context, uh, for a different company, uh, making different products. So yeah, it's most likely that they will actually fail while applying your advice. And that's a, a really bad situation to be in because, you know, of course, they, they will recover from that. They will start making their own choices and they will end up succeeding in their own way. But they will start saying, no, 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 no. don't listen to this guy. He is giving bad advice. Uh, well, use this advice instead. And you get these fights on Twitter where it's this opinion against that opinion. And yeah, you're basically back in, in that loop again, like, why should I trust this advice? Well, uh, because I have the experience that it went well, but you know, the context is missing. So given all of these different opinions and all of these, these people that are trying to also win an audience for them by saying certain things that are likely to be uh, liked by the people. Uh, so yeah, you know, who should we follow? Uh, whose advice should we follow? And I think it's, it's really the answer is to not follow anyone, really. Uh, it doesn't mean we shouldn't listen to advice or be interested in it to hear about somebody's experiences and to experiment with things, but never just follow what anybody is saying. Even though they are such a guru or expert or maybe even thought leader, uh, never, never do any of that. Just think of it like, oh, this, this could be interesting. Or if you, if you get angry about it, in particular, that's an interesting signal because maybe they are onto something and you are just too safe doing your own thing and you can try to maybe consider uh, that other people, uh, that other person's advice. <clears throat> but I, th I think instead of listening uh, and following other people, I think it's most important to listen to what you're doing. Uh, and this is like, maybe more like, not like listening, but tuning in to what you are doing and what kind of uh, message do you get from what you're doing? Because whatever you're building, uh, testing, writing, um, there's always some kind of feedback coming from that. There's always some hint that what you're doing is right or wrong or is rather helpful but not ideal. Um, so listen to, to what your code is doing, listen to what your uh, design is doing and what, what you get from that. Uh, one very important clue is, of course, is this thing easy to test? Because that gives you an idea of uh, am I doing the right thing, usually. But not always. Some things are hard to test and they are still great to do. So, yeah. And while you're listening to code and design, you should collect uh, these things called heuristics. So you should look around. Uh, I'm doing this, this thing now. I make these decisions. Uh, and, and, and at the same time, be very aware of, of making these decisions. Like, uh, be aware of the moment when you, when you decide to go left instead of right. Uh, and then see where you end. And if, if it turns out to be a bad mistake, try to figure out why was it a bad mistake and put that to words. Um, heuristics are things that um, uh, provide a way of finding an answer. So they are not the answer. It's just saying we have a very difficult question, namely, what is good design? What is the good solution for this problem? Uh, and the heuristic can help you find your answer by taking very simple steps, like usually, as a rule of thumb, this would work. Um, and I think instead of uh, collecting advice or rules or principles, it's more like uh, let's collect heuristics, things that worked well in your situation. And I think whenever you talk about uh, rules of programming and advice that you want to give to other people, uh, make sure to, to always do it like this. You can say, ah, this worked really well, uh, and well, just to be honest, I was in this and this situation, this was the context, and I think these, these parts were of influence to the resulting outcome. Uh, and I have come up with this rule of thumb for, for this situation. So that next time, well, we can skip all of the, the problematic, uh, uh, like the first phase of, uh, of discovering what is the right solution. And we can just go to these and these steps and we'll probably end up in a good situation. So this is my advice for you. Uh, <laughs> it's not really, it's like meta advice. Uh, so, Anyway, should we use uh, facades in our application? Should we call like this public static stuff anywhere? 
Uh, should we use YAML files to define our service definitions? Whatever. Uh, maybe write methods you can call with zero, one, or two arguments, depending on what you want from that method. Uh, should we even use middlewares? Well, who thinks about that? You know, uh, should we over-engineer our project using hexagonal architecture? All kinds of questions like this that are going around on the internet and people are very angry about it. Well, do whatever, I would say. And, you know, I have a personal opinion, personal experience with these, these things, and I'm like, no, you don't do that or some of them, don't do some of them. But at the same time, it's not really bad per se. You should definitely try out these things and see why they, were, why they don't work. And then when you have experienced why they don't work in certain situations, and maybe there are other situations where they do work, definitely make sure to keep a note in your notebook. Uh, seems you already have a notebook today, so that's great because it was in the goodie bag. Um, start using that today and collect these things and maybe even uh, share them on Twitter or on your blog or uh, maybe just as an email or on Slack. Just make sure that whatever you experience, whatever kind of uh, hardship you've been through and the solutions you have discovered, they should be shared and people should be able to uh, learn from them. Yeah, write about your experience. That's, that's what I said. Okay, so uh, that was the first part that I added before uh, the architecture part for which you are all here. I hope you were happy to hear about my advice. <laughs> and, well, feel free to just ignore advice here and just say, this doesn't apply to my situation, it's really stupid. Um, yeah, and uh, by any means, don't just try to blindly copy my advice here because you are in your own projects, your own lives, and uh, you have different circumstances. Um, an author that I like a lot is Ken Beck. He, he wrote this book, uh, Extreme Programming Explained, with uh, Cynthia Andrus. Um, it's a very, very interesting book, and uh, I can recommend it if, if you don't know it yet. Like, extreme programming, it sounds very extreme. Uh, it is maybe quite less extreme after many years. Uh, today, many of the practices will seem quite reasonable. But um, there are some very good examples of how code can give you feedback. Uh, and this is interesting. It, it, it links to the topic of listening to your code and listening to your design. So definitely recommend it. There are some very good uh, suggestions there. And it will, give you, it will get you in that mindset. In fact, uh, extreme programming is, is, is for a large part also about testing your code. And testing is another way of getting feedback about your code, uh, learning what works well uh, and what doesn't. But for today, another interesting thing here is embrace change, which is the, the motto of the book. Um, yeah, I think this is, our, this is our business, right? We are constantly changing. Uh, the world is changing. People are releasing all kinds of new interesting software, new technologies all the time. But then we also are sitting at our desk uh, doing the programming, right? The typing. Uh, and then always somebody comes in and says, well, we should, we should do it like this now. Uh, there is some change in the business that, well, we need to improve our, our software now. Uh, but I find in practice change is a really hard thing for, for software projects. Um, many reasons there, like some it's just really old code. Um, people don't understand what's going on anymore. It has been written in a very weird way, usually. This is, this is known as legacy code, of course. Um, it has been untested, undocumented. So really, at this point, change is really becoming very hard. You can't upgrade anything. You can't uh, even uh, go to the next minor framework version because the, the framework is everywhere. So you have to uh, change so much code that it's, it's not feasible anymore. Uh, and, but even if it's, if it's about the domain, you know, it, it's very difficult to upgrade there, any, to, to change anything there, because you don't know how it's supposed to work. It just works. Uh, you don't know how to change that. So, uh, yeah, actually for many, most of the projects that I've encountered, change is a really, really difficult thing. And that's also because there, the code changes for different reasons, and these reasons are completely mixed. Like, all of the, uh, the code uh, has framework code in it, maybe database code, queries, uh, domain logic, uh, data, and sometimes mapping. It's, it's all over the place. And Actually, these, this, these parts of code, they change for different reasons, like framework integration code, sometimes known as controllers, configuration, um, maybe database migration files. They all change for different reasons because mainly, well, when the framework authors themselves or the, the core team decides that we need a new way of doing things, and then everybody has to migrate to the new way of doing things. And sometimes even minor versions, um, minor version upgrades cause a lot of trouble. 
And then there are maybe remote service calls in your, in your project. Like you, you, you may use some API. And at some point, they start uh, throwing weird errors that you don't understand. So you have to fix that code. But the code is everywhere because you are so much tied to the, that remote service. Uh, maybe they need a specific kind of authentication. Or they actually start um, asking you to pay for their services. Wow, who would imagine that? And then suddenly, you have to think about maybe migrating to a different service that is free or you have to start paying. Of course, that's maybe the more logical thing uh, to do. But uh, yeah, th there, there is a reason for, for change in, in these areas of the code. And it's different from reasons of change within the domain model. Because when does the domain model change? Well, it's when there is a new use case, or there is some new business rule that should be applied. Uh, there may be some new concepts that are discovered while talking with your uh, domain experts. So, all of these things have different reasons for change, yet they are completely mixed together in most applications out there. Which is why I think we should be saved by something well, we could call the single responsibility principle for architecture, where we could say that, that what changes for the same reason should be grouped together. Like This is very much reminiscent of the single responsibility principle for classes, where uh, a class should have one reason to change. Well, maybe that's a bit too extreme, but in this case, we can think about grouping things together that are likely to change for the same reason or the same kind of reason, or that sometimes change at the same rate. If, if part of the application changes very quickly, we don't want to mix that with another part of the application that changes very slowly. So this would give you some idea of where to look at. As an example, we could group all the things that are related to your Symfony and uh, Laravel framework, because, well, the framework authors are working all day on their framework, uh, and at that speed, you will also have to upgrade the framework code. But you are working at a different speed for different reasons on your domain model. So maybe group all the things that are related to your domain model. Then there's the ORM, which if you use Doctrine, change is not so fast. But you know, whenever things happen there, you should still keep up with those changes. Uh, and maybe there are other influences in your, in your project. You should think about that, like what changes for what reason. But you may end up with too many groups. And that's not good either, because now you, do, you don't know where to look for, uh, for certain things. So I think the most important distinction in practice, and that's, again, in my experience, is to make the following division, domain infrastructure. If you, if you separate these two, you are already in a much better position, and you don't need that many other groups as well. So these two main groups are the most important ones. Um, the domain consists of a model, sometimes known as entities, value objects, there will be the use cases, something that I would call application services and read model repositories, things that you can do or retrieve from an application. And there will be the objects that the domain needs uh, for talking to the world outside. This is called a boundary object. This is where you jump from the inside of the application to the outside. And then there's the infrastructure group of code, where there is code specific to the framework, uh, or this includes your ORM or all kinds of maybe HTTP clients or any kind of all, all this technical stuff, right? Uh, implementations for boundary objects, so maybe classes that implement the interfaces in the domain. And web controllers, those are of course framework specific, but also CLI controllers. This is all tied to the way that people are able to communicate with your application from the world outside, how they are connecting to your application. Separating these two gives you a, a big advantage over having like the mixed legacy ball of spaghetti thing. Um, and yeah, this is why I recommend using layers. Or, well, layers Layers actually are just groups. So just put things in a group, and, and you're, you're mostly done. Following the, um, uh, the division, I already mentioned, uh, like web framework stuff, domain logic, database integration stuff, um, well, the, then you would have three layers. I usually sort of make it, make it wrap around. So uh, any kind of integration code that is infrastructure, and it could be just wrapping around the domain uh, code. So this is really nice. The domain is the core of your application. It's what your application is about. It's the use cases that you want to support. The, the concepts that are specific to your business domain are also modeled in that code. And then the infrastructure layer makes the connection between your use cases and, well, the actual users, uh, the browsers, the other systems that are connecting to your, your application. Uh, but also your databases, your file systems, your queues, everything like that. Everything that a real application needs, but should be separated from the core logic. 
Then step two, after we have the layers, we should also think about ports and adapters. And this is very much similar to the idea of separating domain from uh, infrastructure code. Right? Oh, by the way, I mentioned the, uh, the Alistair Coburn. He is sort of the inventor of the, of the, of the concept. Uh, and he calls this hexagonal architecture. Ports adapters is, is like an alias of that, um, of that architectural style. So for determining the ports and, and the adapters, we first think about what, who are the actors, what are the actors that are interacting with this application. In part, it should be the primary actors that are talking to our application. That could be users, that could be cron jobs, or maybe uh, other systems that use our API to, to talk to us. And on the other end, there may be like remote services that we talk to, that we need information from, uh, or databases that we store information to, or queues that we send messages to, messages to, or file systems that we store files, well, and so on. And a, a common application will have very, very many uh, actors usually. Uh, and then if you look at how the actors want to use our application, we should think about why do they want to do that. Uh, and this is the intention that they have, the kind of thing that they want from our application. Um, and we should make a distinction between what they want from us uh, and then make that distinction with how they can actually do that, how they accomplish this. Do they use uh, HTTP to communicate with us? Uh, do they have some sort of an FTP upload place where they can put a file and we respond to that? Um, all kinds of stuff there where there is intention versus the implementation details of the actual communication. As an example, uh, in our system, imaginative system, the user could buy a ticket that is like, oh, we have something that allows the user to do that, right? Well, what is, what is this something? We have a ticket controller with a buy ticket action. It gets the login user from the session and gets the user address from the submitted form data, et cetera, et cetera. So lots of technology there. Um, and we should think about, like, uh, maybe mention the framework here, maybe mention the web server. Everything that is needed to uh, support this communication is distinct from what is the user, user trying to achieve with our uh, system. And on the other end, it's the same distinction, right? We need to persist an order, but we don't talk about the implementation yet. That would be a separate discussion. We need to, we need to persist an order, but we use this uh, we use MySQL for that. We have an orders table where we have these and these fields. We use Doctrine Debel, PDO, um, to talk with that database. <clears throat> so all in all, this shows us some examples of how we can separate uh, what is the domain thing we are talking about, what is the use case, the, the, the core aspects of what our users can do with, your, with our application, and then what is the implementation that is needed to support this communication. And this is exactly the distinction between ports and adapters. So a port is just saying, well, we have a way of communicating uh, for the users uh, where they can buy a ticket, right? This is a use case we support. Then we have another port where we need to persist an order. Uh, and yeah, this is just a need from the inside. Usually uh, an outgoing thing is a need uh, from something else. So our application needs a way of persisting uh, an order. And the adapters here are the, the things that make it possible to do this kind of thing, to, to support this communication. So there will be an HTTP adapter, which allows clients or browsers to connect to our application and, uh, well, have a page, have a form, have a way of submitting the form. Uh, and, and then the adapter will translate all of that information into something that our core can understand. On the other end, there is, there is the need to persist the order. But the core itself doesn't really worry about how it's done. That is the job of the adapter, which is living on the outside. In fact, it's living in the, in the infrastructure layer. Um, and it knows how to talk to a database. It will make the right query. It will also make the right type conversions, the mapping, <clears throat> and all of that work that is needed to persist an order. So this kind of uh, clean separation, well, besides being very insightful <clears throat> about what is going on in your application, it's also uh, immensely helping with testability. Because as soon as you uh, start separating uh, like core logic from infrastructure concerns, you have automatic uh, increase of, of testability on the, um, on the domain part. Right? Because what doesn't use infrastructure, what doesn't use a database or a network connection or a file system, is by definition easier to test. Any of these adapters that we have uh, for these ports can be replaced quite easily. 
And this is what happens in something, uh, some kind of test that we can write on a higher level. We can test our use cases um, using sort of stand-in adapters. So instead of talking to a MySQL database, we could use an in-memory storage where we could say, well, instead of um, writing SQL queries and st storing things in a database, we are just keeping these objects in, in memory in an array. Simple enough. And using such replacement repository, we can say we can test a big part of our application uh, without even worrying about the actual database that is going to be used. But at the same time, we can also decide to maybe work on a different adapter. We, we may have decided to go for, an, for a MySQL adapter, but you know, we may have to consider a document database because that makes more sense in our situation. And there, if you have the separation between a port, like a need for communication, and its adapter, its implementation, you can easily add another implementation for that same port, for that same interface. So this allows you to, uh, to switch. You can actually postpone the decision for what kind of database makes the most sense for your, uh, for your situation, uh, because you can write so, many co so much code without even considering storage, or like, is it going to be a, a CLI application or an HTTP application, or do we accept maybe connections through RSS or some other kind of signaling uh, input? Uh, and this is, I find, a very, very good thing for, for architects, where instead of during Sprint Zero, you would sit together and decide what framework are we going to use, what database, uh, what kind of server setup do we use. You, know, you can now say, well, we'll see about that. We'll first learn about what, what is our code going to do, what are the actual needs of our application, and then we make a decision that is informed on that experience, and I'm sure you can make a better decision uh, after that. So that's going to be a very, very useful thing. By separating core from infrastructure, like all the framework-specific code will be in infrastructure, you can now upgrade the framework code much more easily because it's not all over the place. It's not, definitely not inside the core. It's not part of your domain model. Um, so there is this single place, this, this, this uh, well, maybe directory or group of directories where you, where you have to make the changes if you want to keep up with what the framework wants from you. But it's not spreading all over the code base. And you, well, you can just decide to set aside some time and work on that upgrade. And it should not be that painful, because it's not all over the place. Uh, and your domain isn't even touched by it. So the domain can remain as stable as it is, while the other stuff can be uh, upgraded and experimented with. You can even replace the whole framework, or you can start thinking about maybe the, that middleware approach, where you have the pipes and stuff. Um, but um, like, in, in my experience, this even works quite well. You can just say, uh, we don't make a decision for the framework yet, uh, only as soon as we know what kinds of things we would need from that framework. Then we can go shopping, so to speak, for the right framework. Or we can say, maybe we don't need a framework altogether. We, we may just need some routing components uh, and some other, maybe form helpers or whatever. And then at some point, we're done. So this, this really helps you keep the application lean and mean. Before we go to the, the questions, there is still time. That's good. Uh, here are some, some resources. Uh, there is, as far as I know, Alistair's website is currently down. So uh, there's not, the, like, the, the, the most important article that I keep looking up is, not, is no longer online. I'm sure you can go to the web archive or something to find it. But I also find that um, the video is, is quite illuminating. So uh, Alistair in the hexagon. Um, somewhere next year, I'm going to publish my own book on this uh, topic, but not just this topic, also on testing uh, and, and like uh, giving a, a full example of what I have in mind here. There is a growing object-oriented software guided by tests, uh, a very interesting book, which also um, uses the same kind of uh, uh, approach to layer sports adapters. Uh, it uses the same words as I do, so that should, should match quite well. Um, plus, it's also a nice example of how you can test an application's core functionality, uh, like top-down, and make sure that whatever you are working on, whatever you are creating, is actually going to, um, to uh, reach the goal that its stakeholders had. So very interesting stuff. Uh, then there's Von Vernon. I think, in general, domain-driven design would be an interesting topic, uh, because that's what you can do inside your hexagon, right? You can do domain-driven design there. Um, but. Um, yeah, in particular, if you're interested about architecture uh, patterns, then definitely go to um, uh, check out that book because it has interesting suggestions about 
also about structuring your application in a way that uh, matches this whole idea of ports, adapters, layers. Um, just a quick note, layers and ports and adapters are not, not necessarily the same thing. You don't have to combine them, but I find that once you have, you have the separation between core or domain and infrastructure, it's quite easy to, uh, to apply any of these extra uh, design patterns. So uh, it, they are almost for free. Right, so uh, we have reached the moment where you could ask some questions. Uh, thank you. <laughs> there he is. Oh, thank you. <laughs> there, there are quite a few, so it looks like it's working oh, a right, bit better. Okay. Um, <laughs> yeah, so we have 14 minutes, that's great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so let's get started with uh, dispatching domain events. Mm -hmm. So in your view, what's better, like uh, dispatching them from the application service layer, the domain layer, using a middleware, or maybe potentially other <coughs> suggestions for the audience? Yeah. So we didn't really talk about uh, domain application layer, but um, the application layer could be an extra layer within the core that uh, coordinates things uh, within the application, like interactions between uh, one entity and the other. And so dispatching, to me, belongs to the application layer where there is coordination or orchestration. Yeah. That's a tricky one, um, but I think it's very relevant. So people are asking about how do they know they have started over engineering? They have? Oh, I started over engineering their application. Ah, over right. engineering, yeah, sorry about the pronunciation. I'm, no, it's okay, it's okay. Um, I'm, I'm sure you will know when you're over engineering. <laughs> because, uh, and this is again a way of uh, looking at your code, like, does it get in the way of being uh, successful? Uh, it's again about uh, tuning in into the feedback that you get. If you feel like you're making too many classes for nothing, then you're over engineering and you should look at, like, maybe uh, combine some of these classes again. Uh, I definitely don't think that this should be taken as like a dogmatic thing that you should always apply uh, everywhere uh, and that you're doing something wrong if you, if you aren't. Uh, just make sure that, um, uh, like, in my experience, these ideas help you prepare your application for a long future so, and, and keeps the code healthy. But if that doesn't, uh, give, like, in, in your situation, it doesn't give you that result, then definitely don't, don't follow any of it. Uh, but you could also go somewhere in between, right? So it's a bit related to that. So people are asking, like, if you would still recommend an all-single file PHP, like old school, versus mm -hmm. starting with a complex layer architecture in some scenarios or things like that, I guess. Yeah, well, um, the, the, the funny thing is the, 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 tests, the test driver will be the, um, the first client of your code. Uh, and so you, you can sort of wait until the moment that you need for the first time to expose something uh, on a web page. If a client wants to see things working, uh, you can maybe consider showing them the tests. You can say, well, I have these scenarios or specifications, they work. Uh, and, and do we understand this thing correctly? And then you can later add a, a layer on top and just whatever you need, as I, as I mentioned, whatever you need should be added to the project. But uh, I, I usually don't like to go uh, full on a framework, but just think about, do we really need it? Maybe, maybe routing is enough. Then um, it's more about uh, PHP as a language. Uh, if you consider PHP a proper language for layered architectures like Sagonal, or you would mm -hmm. potentially suggest maybe looking at other languages, or I guess... Uh, it's a bit of an open question, actually. No, yeah, well, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, given that we are at PHP Barcelona, like PHP is a language for yeah. everything, so uh, uh, just, just use it everywhere. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, then uh, people are asking how to use database repositories in single responsibility, because technically speaking, like each query has its own responsibility itself, so this concept of single responsibility might be a bit quirky sometimes, I guess. Okay, yeah, yeah. Um, the, the repository just means that you need a place to save things and get them out again. Uh, so you, you, you start with defining an interface for that. Uh, this is my need from the inside. Uh, and then the implementation can do whatever. Uh, and I find that um, uh, at the infrastructure level, usually like big classes aren't a problem because they are out of sight. They, you, you don't care as much about the, the quality aspect there. Then someone's asking, like, they've got a command that does something, and then they need to execute a query to get that something. Mm -hmm. But sometimes, um, yeah, how do they know, would know that the command is finished? So, some patterns to, to acknowledge that, and potentially if they need to retrieve the ID that generated, like, what, what are your thoughts on this such, such, such situation, mm -hmm. let's say? 
Yeah, so commands, events, queries are not really part of this talk, but uh, I, I can imagine it's, it's related to, uh, to, to these kinds of patterns. Um, yeah, maybe too, too big to, uh, to just answer right now. <laughs> uh, okay, uh, and again, you know, if commands and query separation is, is really something that gets in your way, maybe for performance reasons or understandability of the code, uh, just drop it. You know. Are there any questions that are not here? I'll continue, but in case uh, my friends need to move. Okay, so let, let's carry on with that. So people are asking, like, if, should we use doctrine entities just as a table representation, or we should put them inside them? No, we should put inside them any sort of... Ah, so it's about having business logic on, on the entities or like mm -hmm. just keeping them raw. Yeah, so if you want to use doctrine, uh, like it's so, some sort of requirement or it, it's already in the project, then uh, I don't mind putting them, like the annotations or whatever logic is needed, uh, like collections, something like that, uh, doing it right inside your core, in your, in your domain. There is, again, uh, like the pragmatic solution where you can't have both. You, you shouldn't have like domain-oriented entities and then separated uh, uh, like doctrine entities. Just, and I mean, some projects have this, but they have a lot of copying and, and like back and forth between these objects. Uh, and I'm sure it's getting in the way. It's going to take a lot of time. It's not going to add anything in terms of uh, like uh, uh, features or uh, speed of development or yeah. So in, in that case, no. And and just move the doctrine stuff into your domain again. No problem for me. That's a, a bit of an interesting one. It's related to testing. So they're asking about like okay. So we've got all the domain logic, but what about testing outside of the domain logic? Let's say the hexagonal parts and things like that. What are mm -hmm. your thoughts on testing those areas? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, so you should have gone to the doc banner meetup uh, last Monday <laughs> where we talked about testing. <laughs> no, just, uh, just kidding. Um, testing for the core is easy because it's, uh, you can write unit tests, uh, fast to run, easy to write. Uh, you can write acceptance tests that are testing the use cases of the application uh, as a whole, like do they work correctly together. Um, for the infrastructure, you will need integration tests, uh, which don't test the whole application, which is often the confusion, like integration tests is basically an adapter test. So when you write uh, an adapter for a port, like the MySQL adapter, you should test this adapter with an actual database and prove that uh, the adapter correctly implements the, the interface defined for that port. Um, and this gives you like a very clean separate test. Again, it's going to be a bit slower. It's going to be more difficult to set up because you need a database and fixtures, anything. Um, but this gives you a clear view on, did you understand your ORM correctly? Uh, did you make the right assumptions there? Uh, can your code actually work with a real database? Things like that. So I guess the answer will be like, it depends, but let's, let's give it a go. So okay. Um, okay. they're asking like, how would we know that there is an aggregate, right? And when do we know that it needs to be split into little entities? And at that point, what happens with the business logic that might potentially exist? Where do you put it? Or like, is there another class or something like that? So splitting a, uh -huh. an aggregate into little, little classes and then what happens with Yeah, it depends. Yeah, but yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, <laughs> I can tell you what it depends on. <laughs> yeah. no. Again, this is, this is uh, I, I think there are, there's more interest in, in all kinds of related topics here because um, like aggregates is a, is a design pattern from domain driven design. And I, th I find it also hard. I think everybody finds it hard to, to find the right size of the aggregates, uh, big or small. It really depends on, like a bigger aggregate allows you to, to have more uh, protection of the domain invariance, like more rules can be verified within a bigger aggregate, but they are a performance problem. So there is a big thing where everything is related uh, and, and all the changes have to be persisted together. So if you are in a high performance scenario, then you need smaller aggregates because you can make these changes and don't get in the way of other people's changes. Um, so that is roughly maybe the summary of uh, how you can yeah, yeah. Uh, play with that. But, but, but it depends. No? <laughs> yeah, yeah, but, but uh, play with that, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Then it's about orchestration. So um, are domain services also able to orchestrate in your view, or it should be all delegated to the app services for orchestration of little? You know? uh, I don't usually use domain services for orchestration. OK, uh, there ju you go. Just, just <laughs> <laughs> but maybe I'm d working in different projects than you are. So. I mean, I am, I'm for sure that, that, I'm sure that that is the case. That will be the case, okay, right? Yeah. Um, they're asking, like, so, some frameworks at um, libraries for domain layer validations. What is your take on using frameworks for that? I guess, mm -hmm. it depends again. No, uh -huh. <laughs> no, no. Um, so uh, this is always the, the, 
the, the question like, um, can we use third-party code in our domain code? Uh, and yes, you can. Because third-party code is uh, sometimes meant to be like just code reuse and just save you some time from writing all of that stuff. Um, if, if you want to have a valid email address in your domain, then you don't want to write the code yourself for checking like email validation. You will just import a library that can say, ah, this, this looks like an email address. This is correct, right? So there it's, there it's code reuse. But as soon as you start using something like the ORM or uh, maybe um, like a files, file, file open function, you know, if I try to open a file in my domain, that should be a big warning sign. If I try to use an HTTP client to talk to some service in my domain, that is, again, a warning sign. So it's not about vendor code or, or uh, reusable code in general. It's about which code makes the, uh, uh, IO, uses IO, like a network connection, file system, operations, things like that. Uh, as soon as a library does that, uh, it should not be used in the domain. <laughs>